Coming up on DTNS, the robots are taking over the warehouses. Turns out 5G is fast, just like they said it would be, and why Netflix wants to cancel your Netflix account for you. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 21st, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. I'm the show's producer, Roger Che. We were just talking about Squadcast and uh, me causing trouble on Twitter on Good Day Internet. You want to get that wider show? Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Earlier this week, AT&T said it would comply with the National Advertising Review Board recommendation that it stop using 5G evolution in marketing in uh, it uh, as for its advanced LTE service. However, an AT&T spokesperson speaking to the Wall Street Journal says that the decision only applied to ads, indicating that the 5G e logo will still be used on 4G devices. Reserve the right to confuse people. Good job, (laughs) AT&T. The Wall Street Journal reports that Amazon is considering delaying its Prime Day promotional event until September. Will any tradition remain untouched? According to internal meeting notes seen by Reuters, Amazon expects to lose $100 million uh, from excess inventory from the delay. Held last year in July, the two-day promotion brought in an estimated $7 billion. The Guardian sources say the UK's National Health Service contact tracing app for COVID-19 currently in trial on the Isle of Wight will not be deployed until sometime in June. It was supposed to be like the first one out of the gate. Uh, UK Health Secretary Matt Hancock previously said last week it would roll out in mid-May. Riot Games' tactical shooter Valorant is set for release on June 2nd. The game is Riot's first major release since League of Legends and has been in closed beta since April, which will end on May 28th. Valorant will be a free PC title available across the majority of regions worldwide, so says the company. Drops enabled on this next quick hit, a few uh, supply chain nuggets. Samsung began work on a sixth Korean production line to make five nanometer logic chips in direct competition with TSMC. Samsung operates five foundry lines in Korea and one in the U.S. Digitime sources in Taiwan say Apple has engaged LG to make a camera module for a forthcoming 6.1-inch and 6.7-inch OLED iPhone, while Sharp and O-Film will make camera modules for a low-end 5.5 and 6.1-inch iPhone. Samsung announced the Terrace for your house, potentially. (laughs) It's a 4K TV designed for outdoor viewing. The Terrace is IP55 water and dust resistance, has 2,000 nits of brightness, so you can see it when you're outside in the sun. Also includes an HD base T receiver that lets you run power 4K video and audio through a single cable. That's nice when you're running cables through the backyard. 55-inch model is $3,455, 65-inch, $5,000, 75-inch, $6,500, available today in the U.S. and Canada. Do you think that's why they call it Terrace? Nope. Might be. No. <laughs> They're Korean. No. I don't well, know. Well, I don't know. Whatever. Popular show. Google Maps now features an accessible places option. An icon will show wheelchair ac- uh, accessible entrances to locations and additional accessible seating, restrooms, or parking. Google also updated live transcribe on Android to vibrate when somebody says a user's name. Sound amplifier for hearing impaired users now supports Bluetooth headphones. And Google launched action blocks in the Play Store to create one press home screen buttons for multi-step tasks. And finally, EA will open source the code for its real-time strategy game Command & Conquer Tiberian Dawn and Command & Conquer Red Alert under the GNU GPL version 3 license. The code will be released to coincide with the release of Command & Conquer Remastered Collection on June 9th. The code can be used to create mods and can be used in conjunction with a new map editor included with the collection. All right, let's talk about Intel. Uh, for, for years now, Intel has been trying to figure out how to come up with that next thing that helps it evade relying only on x86 processors. Well, here's the latest attempt. Intel announced the acquisition of Rivet Networks. Uh, you may not know Rivet by name, but you might know the killer brand of Ethernet controllers, wireless chips, and management software. Killer NICs are in your laptops from Dell Alienware, HP, and others. They're great for reducing latency and prioritizing traffic, so they're really popular in gaming laptops. 
Intel actually already manufactured the killer wireless AC1550, Nick, a few years back. So these companies have worked together before, and now they will be the same company. The company will be rolled into Intel's Wireless Solutions Group, and Intel will continue to sell killer-branded products and continue to license killer software to customers. However, when asked by PC World if killer technology will be sold alongside AMD processors and laptops, Intel's Eric McLaughlin said, it's probably too early to comment on that. That sounds like a long way of saying no. PC World also reports Intel wants to bring the killer intelligence engine. Uh, that's the one which identifies the best Wi-Fi signal and may even recommend router upgrades to Bluetooth. The hope is that the same thing it can do for Wi-Fi, where, where you can only connect to one thing at a time, but it can tell you what the best ones are, could be used on Bluetooth, where you can connect to multiple Bluetooth connections and... All of them could then work on your PC seamlessly with this software, uh, possibly finally bringing that vision of a wireless dock uh, to your laptop and maybe even complete wireless setups, no wires at all. Uh, that's that's a big promise. We've got a long way to go to get there. But uh, what do you all think of Intel sort of uh, diversifying itself by looking at, at the connectivity and saying, we can come up with a really cool package of, of things for you with the network interface card, I, I, I yes, think Roger? it. I think it goes to what you're saying that they're trying to look for something that they can they can expand on. Wireless wireless technology is something that Intel has experience in, and uh, their 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 push into doing GPUs in the same way that AMD, when they acquired ATI, managed to do with their uh, with their portfolio. Hasn't worked out for Intel. I mean, a good chunk of the staff that was working on their next GP, discrete GPU up and kind of left. So now they're just kind of feeling around for things that they think is something in their wheelhouse that they could really expand out on. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, and no, nobody likes lag. Uh, killer, very good at killing lag. So uh, lag and latency, that could be a differentiator for Intel. Uh, hard to say. Uh, Intel has tried a million of these approaches. We're, we're going to be the ones who lead in this. We're going to acquire this technology. We're going to develop this technology. Uh, but Killer, highly respected. And if they're not dousing that brand, if they're not sinking that brand, even if they make it difficult for a vendor to include it with an AMD processor, I wouldn't love that. Uh, but I don't think that gets rid of the value uh, of the killer parts, especially if you can buy them on your own uh, for certain uses. Uh, so yeah, I think this is a smart acquisition for Intel. We'll see what they do with it. Facebook announced the rollout of new alert tools in Messenger that will display warnings for messages that appear to come from financial scammers or potential child abusers, as well as provide tips and encourage blocking that sender. The machine learning system looks at message metadata, not message content, to determine if a message is suspect, meaning it will work with end-to-end -end encrypted secret conversations in Messenger. That is interesting. The system will look at things like adult users, send, uh, adult users sending messages to large groups of minors or sending messages between users without a connecting social graph, or if that user has been blocked by a lot of other users as potential signals. The feature has been rolling out to Android since March and is now starting to roll out on iOS. This is a fascinating evolution for these kinds of end-to-end -end encryption, and I do applaud Facebook for sticking up for and make and and sticking with the idea that they are going to hold to end-to-end -end encryption on Messenger. But for me, it it is a step forward in what end-to-end -end encryption users. If we're going to understand that end-to-end -end encryption is the standard that you want in any kind of secure messaging app, what is the role of your moderator or of of the the platform itself? And that will be different between, let's say, a, a, a platform like Signal that is there for you know secure privacy that might you know frown upon metadata uh, uh, stuff of any sort, right? Because you might uh, uh, be afraid that the platform will misuse it. Versus Facebook, which there's a lot of parents talking to their kids on Facebook uh, on, on Messenger, and they would applaud the platform stepping in and maybe being a little proactive with this kind of metadata. Well, yes and no. Uh, w w parents don't want them reading the messages their kids send them. They want Facebook reading the messages the malicious people send their kids. And there's no way to determine that except this way. Have an AI determine like, you know what? This might be somebody you don't want to talk to. In which case, 
this is the result of that to say, you know what, if we can read somebody's message, we can read all messages. So let's not get into that. Don't forget, Messenger's already encrypted. It's just not encrypted end to end. So it's not quite as solid as a signal, but it's already encrypted. Facebook's like, we don't want to get into the business of reading people's messages ever. Uh, so yeah. let's build a system that still helps keep in this case, minors. We're not talking about Messenger for kids. We're not talking about kids younger than 13. That's a whole different system with yeah. a whole different set of protections. We're talking 13 to 18, uh, particularly. They want to say, we can tell when someone who's above 18 is messaging someone who says they're below 18. And we can also look for other kinds of patterns. And I, I think people are trying to make more, as, as usual with Facebook, trying to make more out of this than there is, when this is really just a way to kind of suggest to people, hey, be careful about this. The same way when you click on a link on the on a search engine, it might say, hey, this one feels kind of wonky. You can go there if you want, but we wanted to let you know, you might want to take a second look at it. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be some false positive issues going on here, but it does seem like in general, yeah, when you're talking about the age group that you're talking about and the kinds of messages that might be sent to that particular age group, this... This is an, it's a kind of a good middle ground, right? It's like, okay, listen, encryption is really important. What if, what if the AI just tries to, you know, flag messages that we think yes. might be an issue for you, you know, or your loved one, and then we'll go from there. It's like, it's the first step towards, you know, what this is going to look like. Right now, machine learning is good at suggesting things. It's not good at making decisions. No, although it might have a material effect on the patterns of some of these bad actors that if, if, if they are, uh, yeah. you know, they, they you know, force them to jump. Well, through or just right? make them talk differently, which is a whole other thing. Well, no, but this is about who their what, what their accounts are and, and, and the burden of proof that their account would have the standing their account would have to be in or how many messages they're sending at the same time. Stuff like that. Amazon launched a food delivery service in Bangalore, India, creatively named Amazon Food. The service has been testing uh, uh, with select restaurant partners in Bangalore to Amazon employees since late last year. Ordering through Amazon Food is available through the main Amazon app with local restaurants and cloud kitchens required to pass a, quote, high hygiene certification bar, end quote. The launch comes as two of the biggest food delivery companies in India, Swiggy and Zomato, continue to reportedly lose up to $15 million a month subsidizing orders and acquiring customers and have seen orders since COVID-19 fall from about $3 million a day to under a million. I will not make the obvious joke about how Amazon food is not Amazon fresh, uh, but I will point out that Amazon tried a restaurant delivery system here in the United States, and it tanked. They ended up pulling it. Uh, and this is not the time to launch a restaurant delivery service, or maybe it is, right? Uh, up until now has not been the time because what we found is people are far more interested in getting groceries delivered to them than prepared meals out of an overabundance of caution. But maybe those barriers are finally starting to break down. Maybe Amazon takes what they learned from their failure in the United States. It's like, ah, we know how to avoid those mistakes now. And maybe this is the perfect time for Amazon food to launch in India. Yeah, I do think that there are differences in in all you know cultures and how they're going to interact with these things, just as there are in any kind of uh, even regionally here in the United States. Some areas are going to be more into this than others, but if we're going to look at it from a meta level, delivery is something that has become more a part of people's lives over the last three months since all this COVID stuff hit. If you are Amazon and you are saying, "Well, look, the world is about the world has changed." Everyone else was playing by the old rules in the new way. We can have power position if we just have money and patience. Well, Amazon has both of those. Mm. And they like to they 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 like to spend that money. They they don't like to have those profit margins if they don't need them. Uh, so yeah, uh, you may be right. This may be the time to say like, look, we're seeing the inflection point. People are finally starting to order prepared food delivered. Uh, it's too late for Swiggy and Zomato, uh, yeah. but we can we can sweep in and and ride that crest as people return uh, to ordering delivery when they won't want to go to a restaurant. I mean, I think that's what you're saying, Justin, is that well, before there was a certain amount of delivery and that was it. Now we're coming off a period where delivery tanked because of, of worries, 
but now the question is, well, a restaurant reopens. Do I want to go there or do I just want it delivered? Maybe that becomes the safer or choice. Or more to restaurants are doing delivery. Now that restaurants that too. wouldn't yeah, yeah. otherwise do it, now have to do it. And for uh, Amazon, they could be looking at those competitors and saying, you're over leveraged. You guys got into a bidding war for yep. exclusives. Uh, you are overstretched. We can start from scratch and have a better go of it. And that's a really good point because all of these companies lose money on each order right now. Yeah. Uh, they have to subsidize the orders. And that, that's where that cash that Amazon has comes into play. Mobile analytics company OpenSignal examined 5G experiences in Australia, South Korea, the United States, and the UK across 10 carriers to find out, finally, now that we've had 5G for six months, how good is it? Is it any good? Is it as bad as people predicted? Is it as great as people predicted? Well, here's what they found. All 10 operators had faster speeds on 5G than on 4G, ranging from 1.7 to 18.4 times as fast. There were some folks questioning whether LTE would be indistinguishable from 5G, but it turns out right now from these 10 carriers, it's faster. It's demonstrably faster. And OpenSignal, uh, if you don't know, uh, runs apps on people's phones. They're independent. They're not related to the carriers. And they just want to find out what people's actual experiences are. Uh, and I pay close attention to what they say because they have very good testing methodology. Verizon was rated the fastest in the world of the, you know, in the world of Australia, South Korea, US, and UK. But uh, out of all of these, Verizon was rated fastest with an average download at 506.1 megabits per second. T-Mobile USA was rated the worst, the slowest, at 47 megabits per second. Still fast, but slowest of the, the 10 5G providers. However, T-Mobile 5G users spent the most time with 5G available to them. 19.8% of the time, T-Mobile users had a 5G signal they could use, while Verizon had the worst availability. It was super <laughs> fast when they got it, but it was only available 0.5% of the time. Verizon uses millimeter wave exclusively, that's part of the problem. Millimeter wave has a harder time penetrating. And T-Mobile uses the 600 megahertz spectrum. That's a spectrum that can carry LTE, too. Carriers in the mid-range of the spectrum, like Sprint, which will soon be combined with T-Mobile, along with Telstra and all three of the Korean operators, saw a range of speeds depending on the amount of spectrum available. They were in the mid-range on speed, in a mid-range on spectrum, but if they had more spectrum, they had better speeds because they could provide it. So I don't know. I, it seems like 5G, not widely available. That's not a huge shock, but definitely faster. Yeah, my my first reaction was like, yay, I'm a Verizon user. We win. And then I was like, oh, well, we win very, very seldom. I was uh, a T-Mobile user. We're like, oh, <laughs> crap, we lost. Wait, we won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get it more. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the, the whole kind of how is this going to get delivered to people going forward, even though we're in the very beginning stages of this, is pretty fascinating because the this whole, you know, who's the best conversation is only going to continue you know, as it always does, even with, you know, with LTE and with 3G. And, you know, if you if you if you're in a, a, an area that doesn't get a lot of service in general, it's 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 all very fascinating. But I guess the good takeaway from this is 5G indeed faster. Yeah, yeah. I, I think all the rest of the stuff in terms of availability and uh, connection is very early days. Like that is judging a, a toddler by how they uh, burp. Uh, uh, doesn't necessarily say where this is going to go as it matures and becomes uh, bigger and better. But this put to bed the idea that 5G isn't going to be as fast because that ultimately is the proof that we need to see to see whether or not 5G is going to be a transformative technology in, in terms of how much you're going to be able to use it and how much you're going to be able to get out of it. There are other benefits to 5G, arguably better benefits than speed, uh, but speed is the one people understand. So that's yeah. going to help take up. And coverage is only going to get better. It's not going yeah. to get worse. Yeah. In order to limit human contact in its warehouses, Gap, department store chain, uh, Gap also includes uh, Old Navy and Banana Republic, so pretty big one, speeding up the rollout of their own warehouse robots. Gap had originally hoped to triple its warehouse robots by 106 by this autumn. With stores closed, though, and online orders rising, Gap needed more warehouse workers 
Couldn't figure out, though, how to add them safely. So Kindred AI was asked if they could speed up delivery of the robots. That's who is providing the robots. Ten of them have been deployed in Nashville and 20 in Columbus, Ohio, with rollout to four of GAP's five U.S. facilities to be finished ahead of schedule by July. Meanwhile, Geek Plus, which specializes in unmanned robots for logistics automation at factories and warehouses, has struck a deal with Conveco, which makes systems for order fulfillment and distri distribution centers across North America. So they're going to be putting more robots in more places and more warehouses for more companies as well. Uh, this looks to be the beginning of a trend where companies look at social distancing measures and realize we can't get the same production out of people because we can't have as many people working safely in the warehouse. So let's take what we were doing with automation and speed it up because that will help make up the gap. Mm, okay. Can I put on my cynical hat? I have a very I, cynical hat. I didn't hat. know you'd taken it off. Yes, of <laughs> course. You put on my cynical hat. No, I have a more cynical hat. <laughs> this is the way they can cut jobs. Uh, uh, and now they can do it without getting criticized. They had to say it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and uh, they can eliminate headcount uh, uh, in a way that everybody will clap and say, hooray, you care about people while you are paying less people. Yeah, I mean, they won't. If they eliminate jobs, people will stop clapping immediately. Uh, and I always feel the knee-jerk reaction of automation means they'll fire everybody uh, is too simple. Companies don't work on, on you know, evil tie me to the railroad tracks things in most cases. However, we're in a different situation where companies are also feeling the pinch. Yep. Uh, yeah, they've got online orders that are up, but those stores being closed means those sales are down and they may be looking at laying people off. Uh, I'd be curious if anybody thinks that adding warehouse robots might save any jobs because there are situations where automation does relieve the cost pressure in a way that can let you keep some folks around uh, or whether in the short time we are going to see the worst of both, both possible worlds where they'll be laying people off and automating the warehouses. But it looks like automating the warehouses is definitely going to happen. What, what I would say is that automating the warehouses doesn't mean that the jobs are lost. It means that the jobs might not come back. Come back. Yeah. No, exactly. And that I, that I am a believer that when you've got people working and you bring in the robots, it's actually harder to get rid of them. You come up with things for them to yes. do like, oh, but you know, we still have these people. We've always wanted this. Let's put them doing that. That's that's what happened when mainframe computers came in. They didn't fire all the computers. They no. turned them into other jobs. I and mean, the computers mean the people who are doing the computing. Yeah. Uh, but if you've already got rid of them, well, mm. that's a whole different situation. Well, you know. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Netflix will start asking subscribers who don't watch anything if they want to keep their subscription. Customers who haven't watched anything for 12 months since they subscribed, in other words, you signed up, maybe you watched something on day one and you never watched it again, or if you haven't streamed anything in a two-year period, you used to watch something, but it's been two years since you watched anything on, on Netflix, you will get a message from Netflix asking you if you will confirm that you want to stay subscribed. It's like the, are you still watching for your subscription? <laughs> now, if you do not confirm, no, 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 I know I'm not watching it, but I want to keep paying you, then Netflix will automatically cancel your subscription on the next billing cycle. Netflix says these kinds of accounts are less than 0.5% of all members. That's a few hundred thousand all told. Counseled accounts will maintain favorites profiles and preferences for 10 months. So if you do come back, if you do notice it got canceled and resubscribe, if you come back within 10 months, all your stuff will still be there. Netflix director of product innovation, Eddie Wu says they're doing this because it saves people some hard earned cash. That's oh, all it that's is, Justin. So that's so nice of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I don't know. We were kicking around like, what does it all mean this morning? And you know, when the story came out on Variety and it's like, okay, is this an opportunity for Netflix to take a small amount of users, as far as its total user base goes, it's, this is not like a majority of people that would matter to the company, and market to them again? So maybe they like boost their original programming numbers? You know, what, what is the reason that the company is doing this? Because it's not to save a few people some hard-earned cash, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I'm going to remove my cynical cap and oh. say, I mean, but it can be that too, Sarah. Like, it can, yes. I just don't think it is. I think uh, there's more to it, and I want to know what that is. It can be many things. I, I would suspect that the vast majority of people 
who don't watch Netflix and have a subscription uh, uh, that then laps, lapses because their credit card lapses and they just never get around to resubscribing on another credit card. Uh, what I think this is, is a bit of a PR move. Look, they are saying that there are hundreds of thousands of accounts, or yeah, a few hundred thousand accounts that they will cut off, right? So that is them giving up some amount of money. The question is what they are buying with that money. For me, they are buying the idea that they are no longer the monarchy in terms of streaming. We now have legitimate competition that is moving this into more of an oligarchy uh, of, for your streaming dollar. And if you are Netflix, then I do think that we are looking to to get into the uh, a power position of, all right, look what look what we do. Does HBO Max do that? Does Disney Plus do that? Uh, we can demonstrate to our shareholders that the active users we have are indeed active. These are not dead accounts. These are people that are watching all of our programming. Uh, uh, that matters to us. Good guy, Netflix. <sighs> Average revenue per user for Netflix is around $10. You're talking about a few hundred thousand accounts. We don't have hard numbers, but it's easy to guess this is going to cost them a few million dollars So per month. Yeah. Uh, they make $15 billion per quarter. They'll be fine, right? But is it worth a couple million dollars in public goodwill? I mean, will people pay enough? Will people even know the story exists? Will people pay attention and go, you know, that Netflix, I feel more positively about them because they canceled the accounts of people that weren't watching them. I, I just don't know that I buy that. I feel like there's more to it than that. That to make this worth it, Netflix is either saving a cost of maintaining, like even if these profiles go away in 10 months, that that, that reduces the database load enough that, that it helps something, <laughs> makes something more efficient. Uh, or, and Netflix loves to think long-term like this, if you, they may have some numbers that say, when we remind people that they haven't been watching Netflix and we're gonna cancel their account, they start watching again. And when they start watching again, they start telling their friends about shows. And when they start telling their friends about shows, suddenly that person is causing more subscriptions to happen when before they weren't, because they weren't watching any of our shows. Or maybe even they just start watching shows closer to the time that their credit card's about to expire. So they are more likely to add a new credit card or add their new credit well, card number. These are not out. people whose credit card is expired. No, no, no. I know, I know, I know. But let's say, uh, let's assume that to me, the mm. vast majority is the people whose credit cards lapse, right? So if these are people who have, that has not happened, and now you remind them because you do have this oh, conversion. Oh, that's, I think it's all of these, honestly. Yeah. I think it's it's a bunch of these factors together. Because if it's suddenly like, hey, if people don't know they're subscribed and their credit card lapses, they don't keep subscribing. But if we remind them they're subscribed and they stay, they will refresh their credit card and information. Whether, I don't know, maybe. Whether or not you think that this story gets around and that gives Netflix a good reputation, if a subscription came to you and said, you haven't used us in a while, do you just want to stop giving us money? Would you feel better or worse about that subscription? You'd I feel yeah, better. No, better. Two hundred thousand people like, are like, oh, thank Netflix. you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you for not, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe I'd like to resubscribe. Exactly. Because you're reach. a pretty cool company. Pretty yeah. good reach. A hundred, few hundred thousand a month. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, all right. Um, I'm going to stop watching Netflix for two years and experiment and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. See what happens when they market their new uh, lineup of 2022 to you. Uh, thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. Netflix stories end up there all the time, but so do many others because they're the ones that you care about. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We were talking recently about what's going to be the new form factor for mobile devices. You know, we, they all look the same now. So what do we got? We got foldables, maybe. We talked about swivelables. In fact, we tried to coin the term. Uh, Anonymous says, you mentioned swivel screens, and I had to take a picture of one of my two Sony Clias. A landscape design that had a keyboard might be cool, but what I really want is a keyboard replacement that actually works that gives me graffiti. And graffiti. I, I got to say, oh, those Clias. I had forgotten about you, Clia. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you were ahead of your time. Yeah. Uh, pour a little out for the Sony Clia. Yeah. Uh, I was a handspring visor person, but, uh, you know, also jot, not graffiti for me. Just 
<laughs> but I, but still, respect for for the cleaning. I mean, when you look at the form factor, you're like that. It really was very cool, but so much unused space. Yeah. You know, now we're like that bezel's too big. Bezels. Yeah. Oh, look at the bezel. You can tell it's <laughs> yeah. so outdated. Oh yeah. Hey, shout out to patrons that are master and grandmaster levels, including Paul Boyer, Dustin Campbell, and Andrew Bradley. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young, the politics yeah. king. Justin, what's been going on with you? Uh, you know, we had a great uh, episode of Politics, Politics, Politics yesterday, uh, an interview with a, 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 a language professor talking about the metaphors we use about, use about illness and specifically leadership in times of crisis throughout history. Learn why there's a difference when your leader goes from calling an illness an unseen monster to just a massive conflagration. Uh, there is a meaningful linguistic difference to how those metaphors uh, uh, operate, as well as a great story, uh, specifically in the world of new media, uh, where, for the first time in my opinion, a mistress to a sitting congressman revealed all about their affair in her own narrative podcast. Not an interview with somebody else's podcast, spun up her own. You can hear all about it on Politics, Politics, Politics. Uh, folks, we've been getting great reviews from you on uh, the Apple Podcasts app. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. it. It makes our day to see these uh, pop up. Uh, they, they, we have a, we pay for a subscription that automatically pops up any reviews we get in our Slack. So thank you to everybody who's been creating those reviews. That helps other people discover the show. Even if you don't use Apple Podcasts, going in and leaving uh, a few stars uh, will help us get in front of more eyeballs out there. So so thank you so much for doing that. And of course, thank you for your support. Uh, we've had uh, excellent support from a few people who've gotten jobs uh, of all things uh, and, and decided to like share the wealth uh, with us. So thank you for that. Uh, anybody who can support us is welcome to. You get a few perks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. If you've got feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And we're also live. In fact, we do it Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. If you can join us, please do. And find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Shannon Morse and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>